So, uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, it's our last, latest in uh, EGIL live sessions, and I have with me Marty Koskaniemi. And you might expect that uh, I would ask him about his latest piece or about something to do with the state of the history of international law. But instead, I'm going to ask you about a feature of our academic and intellectual life, which is blogging and tweeting and that whole dimension uh, that really has become integral to uh, academic life. I get tweets sent to my emails, people saying, I've just published something in the New York Times. Uh, and sometimes I feel that because of my age, I'm a troglodyte, but I'm interested in your view of this phenomenon of our intellectual and academic life? Well, we are not that far away from each other in our ages, so I'm a troglodyte as well. And so I just barely have an idea of what a tweet might be, and I certainly have never been objected to one or used it. Blogs, yeah, sure. Susan Marx, a couple of years ago, asked me, do I blog? And I would just stare at her, well, what? what? Is that an English word? What are you saying? And Susan was shocked at that point. Now, that's already a couple of years ago. So obviously, I've met with that word and a few of those things, too. Never been terribly impressed by them, though. And does, is there a kind of, as part of the state of the scholarship, the state of the art, the state of academic life, from where I sit, for example, as editor of EGIL, uh, it's actually quite a regular thing because together with the associate editor, I screen all submissions to EGIL. So that's mm. a big task, of a big part of my Sundays. And very often what happens is I write back to an author and say, you know, I really think this piece, if you shorten it a bit, might be okay for the blog. But I find a nice way to say it, it's, it's not suitable for the journal. <laughs> And there's a lot of uh, writing today which you can see is kind of blog impacted, not just because people write to a blog, but it almost becomes a way of thinking, a way of writing to be very, very current, for example. Yeah, I have no appreciation with that. I, can't, I don't want to dismiss it, and it would be really uncool to just say, they are insignificant. So I'm not going to say that. It's just they don't have a tangent to my life. I don't read them. People sometimes come to me and say, Marty, wouldn't you want to blog uh, on a regular basis? And, and I've always said no, because I don't really understand how they operate in the world of the media. What sort of an impact do they have? And, and as you earlier said, so I also think that they are probably kind of second-rate arguments, arguments uh, which uh, you are, uh, are incapable or unwilling to publish otherwise. So you squeeze them into a hamburger-sized thing, which you then uh, invite other people to digest. I'm, it isn't appealing to me. Mm -hmm. I must say, because there's one blog which I do look at, which is Egil Talk. It's our blog, etc. And sometimes, there's some really acute stuff. And then I wondered to myself, I wish this would turn into a real full-fledged scholarly article, etc. But some of our readers and some of our readers of both EGIL and the blog, I've heard sometimes people say to me, the blog is much more interesting than the journal. <laughs> it's true. But yeah. I, I, I hear that comment. No, I, so one should be very careful not to to be too critical of that. And uh, just as an outside commentator, it seems to me, oh yeah, of course. So if it's a question of recent events and like, for instance, so I've been involved in the TTIP uh, talks in Finland and in, uh, in Brussels a little bit. And so it seems that many of the people with whom I interact in the transatlantic partnership critique and endorsement or whatever, they do this inside the blog, blog sphere. And for them, I'm, I'm sure that it's a useful way of having an impact and, and having a sense of where people are, what's the, where the political center now is, what's, 
acceptable and what's unacceptable there. In, in that respect, it's, I find it even maybe an indispensable, uh, an indispensable conversation. Can I ask you a related question, uh, again, about which, uh, to put it at best, I have mixed feelings. So uh, peer reviewing is becoming more and more difficult. Oh, why? Uh, why? Uh, you know, I've written about it once or twice in our editorials. It's very difficult to find peer reviewers. I would say that we get turned down regularly. We now have a policy that when we publish an article, we, we say to the author, you have benefited from peer review, so we expect a strong moral obligation that when we turn to you to peer review, right. you will not turn us down. But it's more and more difficult to find uh, suitable peer reviewers. And very often, even when people agree to do a peer review, what comes in is one or two paragraphs which are pretty useless. You know, this is a good article, publish it, or this is unpublishable, but not the kind of serious peer review that the word peer review suggests. And um, my half-baked analysis is that part of the problem is that it's so easy to get self-published today. You know, SSRN, you just, every piece you write, you put on SSRN. I've never done that either, but again, maybe it's just because I'm a troglodyte. But to my way of thinking, precisely because there's so much published, etc., that peer review becomes an important institution. At least our attempt is to tell our readers, you might not, it might not interest you, but because of peer review, we have a pretense that we really only publish quality stuff. And yeah, I think so, for me, the question, so every now and then, of course, people ask me to, to review stuff, and I try to do that as often as I can, and sometimes one declines. Um, my experience is that the workload of academics has become, the workload unrelated to their principal scientific research has become so heavy that it's really hard to take on yet another assignment that comes from the outside. You didn't expect it. The, the email lands on your computer one morning and asks you to peer review this 45-page uh, essay on something that you're not really working, not at all working on at the moment. So I think most of us understand that, well, there is an obligation, that you should do something with it. But most of us are also under a heavy heavy load otherwise. So I, don't, so I don't think it's so much about there being the possibility of self-publishing. On a related issue, I think there's too much publish, publishing and there's so much uh, unnecessary publication going on in the field. So that's a, that's an, a related issue. But I'm, I'm not sure to what extent that relates to the difficulty of having people peer review stuff. Maybe it just contributes to the number of requests that uh, the proliferating number of journals then put to you and that would make it then easier for you to decline so if you say you get five one out of five peer reviews you decline if you now if you get 20 review requests a year then you're already declined quite a number of those uh, it's yeah. hard to say i think there's too much publication going on that's a big problem uh, another way of another way of uh, putting it is too much writing not enough reading <laughs> Yeah, well, you said that. I didn't. <laughs> but I do say that. Yeah, I agree. There's, uh, everybody is so busy writing, there's less time for reading. I, I find it anomalous because in the promotion, uh, in the promotion area, there's increasing reliance on peer review, publication in peer review journal. So people want to publish, for example, an EGIL, not because it only... Uh, brings their work to the notice of a large group of readers, etc., but because it's a highly yeah. rated peer review journal. But we really struggle to get good peer reviewing. That's sometimes people complain, why does it take so long to get my piece out in Egil mm. or to get an answer from Egil? Understandably, I think. And the reply is because it sometimes takes us uh, so long to get people to agree to do a peer review and then to do the peer review. I think our record is uh, somebody keeping us waiting for 187 days. <laughs> uh, I just want to thank, uh, thank you, Marty, on behalf of myself and of all the viewers of EGIL Life for sitting down for this very brief and perhaps unexpected topic.
Yeah, but... well, no, it's an interesting topic. I think it's something I haven't really spoken in public about, but you can't avoid thinking about it while one is an academic. This is our daily life. So thanks for the invitation. It's great to be here in Florence. Great to see you also. Thank you all very much.